I'm Christina Rivera, and I'm coming to you from uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, where we're on like the third week of just severe humidity that is, as you can see, um, just challenging in many ways. We've got doors at church that won't open unless you just like really pull them open. Um, and uh, yeah, people are just ready for the humidity to, to uh, be done with. Jessica? Jessica Star Rockers. I'm also in the Seattle area and I am going to be working hard to remember how this all goes behind the scenes. So thank you for your patience this morning. You're going to be on Twitter? Where, where are you going to be? I'm on Twitter. Yes, that's right. That's what I do. I'm on Twitter, hashtag The View. I'm on Facebook. I'm going to be following your um, live comments and questions and giving those to our hosts and our guests today and um, trying to keep track of all the things. So glad to be here. That's great. And our guest today is Mandy Goheen. Mandy, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Mandy Goheen. I live in Montgomery, Alabama, and it is a little stormy here today. We're having some um, hurricane rain uh, or tropical storm rains. So, and it's very humid here, so I can totally relate um, to that. It's great it's to great. join you all. That's great. Well, we'll get to Mandy in a few minutes. Let's start by just catching up. It's been a while. Christina, let's start with your health. How are you doing? When we I'm end doing, this, you're having some I'm, trouble. Yeah, I had some cardiac issues um, in the spring um, and was trying to, before summer hit, get discharged from the cardiologist. And they're like, um, but I'm feeling so much better and have energy back and all that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm pretty stoked about that. And uh, we had a great summer as a family. We did some, um, you know, traveling, of course, to General Assembly, but then uh, directly from General Assembly, I came back um, for a couple of days uh, just to wrap things up. I was supposed to be back for a week, um, but mi gente, um, was doing a political action uh, to abolish ICE and stop sessions and stop Operation Streamline in San Diego. And they had put out a call for um, uh, clergy allies in, in particular. Um, and so a group of Unitarian Universalists, uh, clergy and, and um, UUs went to San Diego almost immediately from <laughs> coming back from GA. Um, and then uh, from there, we went to Puerto Rico and were there for um, a couple of weeks and did some volunteer work in some of the most um, heavy hit areas. It's actually the town that um, the hurricanes made landfall at in Puerto Rico. And um, this is coming up on a year anniversary of that. So we are on the view are going to do a uh, view episode about Puerto Rico, and we've got some a uh, couple of ministers who um, have ties to PR, and then are also going to try and um, get in somebody from the congregation in uh, Puerto Rico. So I'm looking forward to that. Wow, yeah, I'm I'm really interested to hear that. It's you know it fades from the front page, but not for the people who live there. <laughs> Yeah, especially with the recent, um, so they just finally upped the count to what everybody knew what was happening in Puerto Rico. They had previously reported that there were 64 people who died as a result of the hurricanes. And I mean, you could have asked anybody in PR whether or not that was a good number because everybody knew more than people than that. Um, so they recently uh, did a study and have now they have an official total that's just under 3,000. And those are people who died from lack of water and health, as well as the people immediately impacted. Do we know that that's a more accurate number? We do. It's actually a study by, I can't remember if it's George Mason or George Washington University. And they went in and did a statistical study based on previous records uh, at the same time, um, as well as the different places as well as studying what people um, died from. Um, so they said, you know, as you would expect, the elderly and poor were 
um, you know, uh, impacted more, but there was a statistical um, amount that they could identify um, had to do with. And now they're, that was the first phase. The second phase is they're going to go back in, I believe, and see if they can determine folks who died immediately. You know, that was within a six month window of the of the storm. And so now they're going to go back in and see what they can do about um, um, determining the, the number that was immediate from the storm, um, as well as what they found was you know, the reason the statistic wasn't good, we're going into what the, the show is going to be about, but um, was that uh, health officials just didn't know how to report deaths as related to um, environmental disasters. Um, so they're also going to uh, take a look and see how they can get some on the ground training um, for, uh, for folks to be able to, to do better in the future. Um, because we know, we know that this, you know, the the environmental impact of, of climate change is just more and more severe and severe um, weather patterns are going to happen and, and are going to affect places like um, Puerto Rico and Haiti and, and um, the Caribbean. Well, I will look forward to a deeper and longer discussion about that. I know that in New Orleans, you know, all kinds of people, elderly people, didn't have meds and died of diabetes. And, you know, just there was a long term. So in a way, we'll probably never have a real number of, of the totals, but at least that's much more accurate than that 64 that was getting thrown around ridiculously. Aisha Hauser, how did you spend your summer? Well, I was, uh, I spent um, a lot of it on vacation with my family. I'm on sabbatical until October 1 from uh, the church that I, where I currently am the director of lifelong learning. Um, so I not only uh, spent time with my family, but I also co-led a, the Musicians Network Professional Day with the Reverend Bill Sinkford and Beth Norton, who's a musician out of Massachusetts, uh, talking about collaborative leadership. Uh, and the, the official title was uh, Collaborative Leadership and Antidote to White Supremacy Culture. So um, along with that, I, uh, the Reverend Deanna Vandiver and I uh, are working on a book on collaborative leadership. So uh, it's, been, it's been actually more busy than I anticipated a sabbatical would be, but may, it's also my first sabbatical I've ever taken, so maybe I don't quite understand what sabbaticals are. <laughs> They're not an extended vacation, uh, but it's been uh, really um, rich and engaging and I've got, I've had some really interesting conversations because one, I mean, I was kind of going into it hopeful that collaborative leadership was a no brainer, uh, but, but, you know, I mean, there, there is, there are uh, folks who um, aren't quite as sold on the idea of collaborative leadership as I am and what it means. And, um, and, and I will name, it is mostly ordained clergy that are, uh, that I've heard the most from. Um, although I've heard at least one religious educator say, no, I like that the minister's in charge of everything. I wouldn't have it any other way. So that that's not the typical religious educator response that I've heard. Uh, however, uh, so that's, that's been interesting. So we'll see where that goes. But I've had, and then next week I'm going to um, present at the, uh, in Salem, Oregon, the state of Oregon uh, is having a diversity conference for all their employees, which is maybe about 1,100 people. Uh, and, I, and they hired me. They heard about me and sent me an email saying, hey, do a proposal. I'm like, okay. And so. I'm pretty excited. So that'll be next week. So I can tell you after next week how it went. So that's me. Well, that is really exciting. That's that's a whole new world opening up there if you got government contracts. <laughs> I know it's a whole new world. And I, I mean, definitely part of me, I, I, what I've had to remind myself is I actually called the person and said, uh, first, I don't know. I still don't know who recommended her to me because she pointedly said you're recommended. Um, but I'm. But after talking with her, what I have to remind myself is I'm not talking to a UU audience. I mean, this is not even 101. <laughs> so I, I genuinely, I mean, I have to. I'm, there are going to be people in the room who I come, you know, are completely not people I would ordinarily, you know, be in my sphere in any way. And so I gen, I, I am very mindful of that. That that I'm. I'm. It, it'll it'll be fascinating for sure. I mean, I definitely don't know exactly what to expect, but. Um, because I imagine most of them are mandated to be there. It is not a self-selecting thing <laughs> where like, yay, a workshop on race and diversity, woohoo. So uh, yeah, I, I will, I'm, I'm curious myself and I'm definitely mindful that I'm coming in as an educator and as someone who 
um, is not talking to people I usually engage with. So yeah, I don't know. It, yeah, it's, but we'll see. I'm, I'm open. I'm open to it. It'll be interesting. What are they calling the workshop? Uh, so the they asked me for the whole, whole proposal. So it's two parts, race and identity and race, part one and two. So the first one, the 90 minutes is going to be identity, kind of naming, telling our story. They asked for pre-work. So I asked folks to watch Danger of a Single Story, um, the TED Talk by Shimananda, um, and really get folks to a place where, um, and, and do the iceberg, the, the you know, what people see and what's under. Uh, and then the second part, we will delve into race. And I actually suggested folks read the Ijeoma Luo book. So you want to talk about race and white fragility. Who knows if they did? I don't know. But um, so I'll be kind of pushing the envelope a little bit for folks who, who so it'll be interesting. Um, so that's, that's the two parts. It's 90 minutes each, and I'll be repeating them over two days. So um, it's, it's very, it's just race and identity. It's parts one and two. So <laughs> I'm encouraging folks to go to both. Well, we'll be excited to hear about that. When are you doing that? Next week. So I actually oh. won't be on The View next week. So I'm, okay. I'm leaving for Salem on Tuesday, and then I'll be back Friday. So. All right. Well, you'll have stories to tell. That's great. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I wonder, you mentioned white fragility. I wonder if your buddy Robin D'Angelo promoted you there. Uh, it wasn't, they gave me the name of somebody who I, because I asked her, because actually they asked me what to charge. And I'm like, what would you charge? I've never, you know, quite done anything like this. out. I know what I charge you use, but um, uh, so no, she's not going to that. And I'll also be going to the race and pedagogy conference in uh, Tacoma, which will be at the end of September. And I'm also part of a couple of workshops there, but um, she did not <laughs> actually, I asked her, I'm like, did, did, you know, so yeah. Well, and Asia, you and I are going to do some work together on white supremacy. Yes. I'm excited about that. Next Very summer, and the summer after, they've already rebooked us not seeing what happens the first time. My goodness, that's quite a leap of faith. It's very trusting. Like... <laughs> no pressure there, Meg, not at all. <laughs> Very excited about that. At a UU camp at, in Seaback. So that'll be, that'll be fun. And my summer, I got a puppy, which the dog's bladder now takes up about a third of my brain. She's outside now, we're good, but I always know how full it is, what time it is. Um, this morning, she was doing so well. This morning I opened the door to get the paper and she ran out the door. And when she runs out the door, that's it. So I'm mad at her. We didn't go to the dog park, but she doesn't know why, but I do, so. Anyway, but I love her, even though she's a bad dog. And so, yeah, that's been more time than you'd think, uh, taking care of this dog. Kind of, I remember I got a puppy once on sabbatical and I ended up calling it my maternity leave for a dog <laughs> because it's so time consuming. This is not a small puppy though. I, I knew I didn't have time for that, but anyway. And what else? You know, I, I had a pretty mellow summer. I mean, after, after GA, I had a couple small trips. I went and preached at the Oak Park Congregation, which the Frank Lloyd Wright building that they've redone, staggeringly beautiful. And the most interesting thing to me is that unbeknownst to me, I wore an outfit I never wear that was exactly the same colors as the, as the place. And so it felt like Frank Lloyd Wright had instructed me what I was allowed to wear. Um, and, you know, I just, I just putzed. And as people who know me know, I'm in kind of a new fun relationship. And so, it, you know, it's a hard time in the world. It's a good time to have somebody to love. So I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm also really seeing afresh how much the world was made for couples and in ways that make me really cranky for all the single people. So just to say single solidarity, I still got it. Anyway, all that's been going on. And meanwhile, Jessica. Oh my gosh. Um... My son just missed the bus. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed all of a sudden I just like disappeared from the call because my child was still here and the, <laughs> I knew that was not okay. So um, yeah, my summer is, um, I have a fifth grader who uh, is doing great, but you know, it, it requires a lot of mothering. <laughs> But it's been good. We've had a good, we've had a good summer. And um, I go see the MFC here in a few weeks. So I'm in study mode, which I've been in all summer. And um, 
yeah, it's, you know, it's great. And I'm so uh, grateful. I'm so grateful to be on The View and to get like this wisdom because I feel like this past year, there, this has been one of the places I have learned the most about what's going on with Unitarian Universalism. And just, I think anybody who's prepping for the MFC should go into the archives and listen to The View seriously. And um, I think subscribe to the podcast because there's a lot of good wisdom Good plug for the view. You know, I wanted to say before we launched today that we've gotten more explicit about our mission here, which has been our mission, but we've just explicitly said that what we really want to do here is to promote a multicultural, multi-generational, anti-oppression, anti-racist, intersectional, all the good things, kind of Unitarian Universalism. And I, I too learn a lot here from hosts and guests. And yeah, it continues to be a place of great learning and and I hope that people um, appreciate it as much as I do and we do. <laughs> so that and also to say what I said yesterday in a CLF staff meeting, which is that I never got the logical consequences for kids things because when they miss the bus, the logical consequence would be that they would walk to school. But in fact, is that their, that their mother's day is now taking them to school. So the logical consequence seems to fall on the parent is the way that I experienced that. I never could figure out how to move it. <laughs> I'm with you. I am with you. <laughs> so today's guest is Mandy Goheen, who is the director of the prison ministries at the CLF. And Mandy has been there for a couple of years and radically transformed what's going on. And did some really exciting work at GA this year. And so, Mandy, let's start with the action of immediate witness at General Assembly and how it came to be and what it was and what happened. Excellent starting point. So the action of immediate witness that was passed is called Dismantling, Dismantle Predatory Medical Care Practices in Prisons and in Prisons for Profit. And when that was passed, there were two action items for us, which is to educate ourselves and to do more direct action. And why we landed on medical practices instead of all the hundreds of other problems that are in the prison industrial complex at this time is we wrote our members who are incarcerated. Right now we have nine or 890 we're getting ready to hit 900 and we'll be hitting a thousand this year, a thousand members joining the CLF from prisons across the country. And so um, we asked them, what is your number one justice issue and what do you want us to communicate to General Assembly and kind of explain, they always write letters to General Assembly and we usually do like send them a postcard from there or there's some news from General Assembly that they get every year. But this time we were went ahead and asked them the question and over and over again, medical care practices came up and specifically the fact that people who make money, who are lucky enough to have jobs, who are incarcerated, make as little as 16 cents an hour. And they pay, and that's in the federal system. And in the federal system, every time they visit the doctor, it costs $2. And so if you make 16 cents an hour, to pay for a $2 medical visit is a, a week's work, you know, or more. And that's not even the worst part. The worst part is they take those medical bills and they put them on the front of their commissary accounts. So before that they can buy um, toothpaste or a bag of chips or anything, socks, they have to pay for the medical bills first. And what this does is it puts pressure on families to pay people who are once again lucky enough to have families, it puts pressure on them to pay the medical expenses of the incarcerated person. And these families are already in stress because they have a family member who's incarcerated in the first place. So it's really an arcane practice. And, and the other part is it's against um, Nelson Mandela's rules of minimum treatment of prisoners for this to be going on to charge people. Not all prisoners make any money at all, do they? Oh, right. What about the prisons where they don't make salaries at all? Texas is really the 
shining example, I guess is the wrong word to use, but Texas is the main example that I say because it costs $100 a year to have access to medical care in Texas, and they're not allowed to make a living wage at all. And any wage, they still work, but they don't make a wage. And it's the same rules in Georgia, although although they, they don't even make sixteen cents an hour. No, no. So families are completely irrelevant here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they make zero. Right. And so to have medical care, they have to pay a hundred dollars. And they have court costs and other things get tacked on that commissary account too. We have one member who has nearly two thousand dollars in charges on his account and when he is really and he's what they call indigent which means he has no family he has no income source and so when he leaves he'll have he'll still have that bill and it may be part of the structure of his parole and probation either to not be allowed out before he pays that bill or to pay that bill off when he's released so um it really is a debt that follows people and it gets people into trouble as far as when they do get out, you know, there's so many more predatory lenders waiting out there for people who are in poverty just to swoop in and take over. And, you know, I have heard of people getting, for example, like payday loans and stuff like that to pay for their members and their family members in prison to help with their costs of being incarcerated. So. It's a big deal. Um, and it was really, really inspiring to have Unitarian Universalists really listen to us and gather around and really, I, I felt a little uncomfortable with the amount of surprise that they had about the issue. Like it, it's just something that, I guess I was shocked when I figured it out too, but just to see the shock on their face and the concern. And we had over 300, um, signatures for our AIW and Jess led the team for that. She was part of the team that led the volunteers. Do you want to say anything about how that felt to be running around doing that, Jess? Yeah, I mean, you know, I have only been to a couple GAs, um, but man, there is nothing like, you know, being a part of that AIW process and particularly on behalf of the, our incarcerated members who this was what they, you know, this was what they wanted us to go there and talk about and represent for them on their behalf. It filled me with so much joy and uh, to be able to do that. And um, it made GA so amazing. I mean, I think it was an amazing GA period, but um, to be able to do that and, and, uh, folks were so uh, receptive and um, really eager to hear about it and, um, and then to have a good result. I mean, that was the best. It really was, it really was amazing. And our volunteers, our um, CLF uh, members were there and they were, um, man, they were amazing. They were working hard and yeah, it was a great team effort. It was great. It was exciting and it was a little stressful too to go through the process of the AIW, specifically like the mini assembly where they were editing it and like wanting. So we actually had a team in place in the mini assembly too, volunteers who knew how to, what we wanted to maintain the integrity of the document. So there were people in place for that too. So we were really pleased and, and there were such good issues brought forward. And to be in the top three was such an honor, but it made me feel a little, I, I'm glad they're changing the process. I think that other folks need an opportunity to pass, to get their voices heard as well. I don't know about 12 of them, but you know, surely we can, we can talk more about what folks have going on. So anyway, that's kind of the GA, um, spiel but what came out of the AIW is two things that education piece and the uh, um, direct action piece and what we're doing at the CLF is trying to set up systems for that to happen for folks. So we're having a training in Montgomery, Alabama um, on challenging the prison industrial complex in October 14th weekend and then we have an online class about the prison industrial complex coming in November 
And then as far as giving people access to do direct ministry, we're working on building up our pen pal relationship. So if anybody out there has been thinking about becoming a pen pal, now is a great time. We're going to be matching in September, so you wouldn't have to wait that long. And then also um, exploring the idea of opening church-based and, and state-based satellites to take care of the folks who are in that area more more vigorously and follow the legislation that's in the area. Like if it was a state-based worthy now CLF program that a church was running, they would be more educated and tuned into what the folks who are members of the CLF in prison in those states need. So we're kind of exploring where that might go. So right now there's a strike that's been going on in prisons. Um, can you talk about that? And of course we don't know if CLF members are involved with that or not yet, but um, what, what 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 do you know? What do I know? Are they um, striking? What's going on? Have you heard any anything positive that's come out of it? Well, the one thing that's really cool is it's gone from a United States prison strike to a global prison strike. So there are people in Australia and there are people in. Um, South America, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact places, but it is turned global. And so that's the, that's really exciting. Um, the, it's about wages, it's about slave labor, basically, you know, and wages, we can't even imagine the living conditions that they're in, and then that they might make, if they're lucky, 16 cents an hour working in dangerous conditions in furniture stores and sheet metal store, you know, shops and all this work that we would never want to do in the free world. They're doing it um, here in Montgomery area, the women's prison, they sell all the uniforms for all the other prisoners. What a depressing, and they make like 10 cents an hour doing it. What, what kind of job is that? So that's why they're on strike. And, you know, it's just, it's also lifting up the fact that the prison industrial complex is modern day slavery. And, you know, to open people's eyes on the outside, what happened in the prison where the strike started is there was a riot and seven people were killed and the uh, guards and the EMTs didn't come for 45 minutes. So from that, they started organizing in that prison in North Carolina and it spread out from there. And our prisoners tell us all the time that they're goaded into uh, fighting with one another by the the guards, that it's one of the sports of the, the guards. I mean, we just hear that story constantly as a thread in their, their letters. Mm -hmm. us, but, yeah. Mandy, can you tell us a little bit about what the, um, what the goals are of the strike and the, the specifics of what is being asked for? Is it increased in wages? Is it better access to, you know, different types of, um, of work what yeah that and you know basically prison reform and having some kind of training and rehabilitation services available to them they're not just asking for more money they're asking for humane treatment they have um nine demands which basically are focused on just having a humane living space and being treated like a human being and not being used as slave labor. That's really the focus of their demands. And they have some really good advocates. Um, and and the, we made a statement, Susan Frederick Gray made a statement last week about the prison strike and I posted it on the prison strike website so that they would know that Unitarian Universalists are standing with them and that we care about what's going on. Um, other faith communities have also done that. Um, there was a Buddhist group that did it. And I think that there are other Christian organizations who are standing with them as well. So that's, um, it's terrible, but I think that the news, the more we watch the news, oh, the news we choose to watch, um, it, it's harder to peer upon it, but sometimes we just can't look away and I think that's what's going on. They want our attention and they want media coverage and they want people to know what's going on and inside and how dangerous it is. That was one of my my questions is um, so they're they're looking for 
folks to become more educated about this. Are there any other specific asks that they're having for people that they're asking for folks yeah. to do? Um, yeah, the, the contacting, becoming more educated about your own prisons around you and what their policy is. One of the things they're doing is um, trying to boost um, self-esteem um, for the people inside. So they're having these sound actions where they're going and um, playing music across the walls for the folks. And um, so that's really great. And they want people to write letters and organize phone trees so that everybody, if you have a prison in your area, everybody can kind of flood the prison with phone calls. At a certain time, they're calling it zapping. Um, donating to the strike fund is another important thing that we can do. Um, and just endorse the strike. Um, they called for Labor Day solidarity. And so we filmed, um, we're doing this new little video blog called Yard Work. So we filmed a yard work and included Susan Frederick Gray's um, statement in that this week so that we could on Labor Day stand with them. I think and, the, I feel like the big thing is um, holding on to our humanity because um, what's gone on, even truth be told, since the crime reform bill that Bill Clinton signed, um, this for-profit prisons and mass incarceration simply skyrocketed and it's gotten out of control and we've and it's it's bad for everyone in the system most especially the people who are incarcerated but we also kind of are and it's kind of happening with ice and border patrol agents is where people are being conditioned to um lose their humanity and who they are and and, and empathy and, it, and it's insidious and and i i call our in prison industrial complex a cancer on our soul on our collective soul uh, and, and I'm, I'm really grateful to CLF uh, for um, being part of the UU arm of, of bringing this to the forefront. Um, and I just post, there's actually a whole website, incarceratedworkers.org uh, campaign prison strike. So Jessica's gonna put the, uh, and it has all the information on how you could support this. There's actually uh, a movement in Seattle, well, not just in Seattle, but that I, I became aware of it in Seattle of a prison abolition movement uh, that, that they're from, and, and it's, uh, many folks who have come out of uh, being incarcerated are leading it. Um, and I talked to a police officer once in Bellevue about a lieutenant, and I said, I'm, I'm actually a prison abolitionist. And, you know, and he said, well, what about people who do, you know, who really don't belong in society? I said, well, we need to expand our imagination about how we um, treat folks who have transgress transgressed we're a punitive society. We want to throw people away and just continue to punish them. And that eats away at who we are. Um, and I think that's the bigger picture. And so I'm really grateful. Um, and I'm really excited and, and actually will reach out to you for more information on what locally we can do, because I think having this in our congregations um, also um, is, is very important. So thank you for your work. Yeah, and I, I want to bring up two other demands that they have just real quickly because it has to do with after post-incarceration they're asking for voting rights and they're asking for pell grants so if you have a drug charge there's all these um, collateral consequences of incarceration and one of the collateral consequences of course is you have to wait a certain period of time and go through this big process to learn to get to vote again and and then if you have a drug charge you have no access to pell grants and student loans. So that's another thing that people can do is look up the collateral consequences in your state. The State Bar Association lists them. And it's really interesting to see like here in Alabama, somebody isn't allowed to go visit their family if they're on parole and probation who live in public housing. They can't be there. They can't receive food stamps. If they have a drug charge, by the way, it's not, you know, the it's really interesting because it focuses in on this war on drugs and this war on people of color, honestly. And it's just really, like you said, insidious and it's very specific to who it's target, poor people of color. And, you know, I have 
for sons of color and to think about the fact, the thing that hits me the hardest is to think that one of them statistically might end up in prison is really hard. A really hard thing for me to make peace with. Um, but I have to just keep looking, you know, looking at that and talking to them about it and talking to them about how to be safe. And I know that's not what this is about, but it is, you know, how to be safe around the police and how to behave. Um, in Montgomery, Alabama, as a person of color. So kind of a tangent, but. Well, you should yeah. mention the skyrocketing um, imprisonment under Bill Clinton, which is certainly undeniable. But I mean, just to get back to the root of this, I think the 13th Amendment is um, worth mentioning for people who haven't seen the movie, the 13th. Do you want to talk about, because it seemed, I mean, it was very targeted, Slave labor was very targeted. It always has been. It's, it's skyrocketed lately, and the privatization is new. But yeah, and and this um, notion, you know, and learning my history about living here in Alabama specifically, this notion of slavery using mass incarceration as slavery is nothing new. It's something that started in the mills here in Alabama, and as a way to in Birmingham specifically, a way to have expendable labor now. They no longer had value. They were considered even more expendable than slave labor and hundreds and hundreds of people died. And it's just, that's the system that we're, that we're coming from. That's the roots of this, is this shift into Jim Crow and mass incarceration. And, you know, specifically targeting people, think about, Cocaine, for example, crack versus um, powder cocaine and how crack has such a higher <clears throat> penalty. And, you know, that's a very targeted thing. Um, but this notion of slavery, pr using prison work as slavery is nothing new. It's just how, what kind of package you put it in. And I think that um, one of the things that the private prison industry has is a lot of money and a lot of lobbying power to make sure that these systems stay in place. What's interesting is when you hear people like the Koch brothers say things about wanting prison reform or, and that's not really what they want. What they want is privatized home incarceration, that they can make a profit off of the, eye, the ankle bracelets or whatever the GPS tracking device is. So, we need to be wary when we read things and like read between the lines and make sure that the folks who are asking for prison reform aren't asking for just another new structure for slavery and mass incarceration. And money making. And money making. Yeah, I was just what going to say is that um, so in California, you know, they passed, quote unquote, uh, prison reform two weeks ago in terms of bond and going to um, what, they're, what they're, you know, kind of framing as all um, doing away with bond mm -hmm. uh, and that it's all going to be, you know, based on, recon uh, you know, released on your own recognizance and, and assessments and all of those kinds of things. And it sounds great. You know, it sounds like, oh, right, great. We're getting rid of bond. But if you really dig deeper and you look at all of the groups that are supporting this, and all those groups that are saying no, this is this is actually worse. It's exactly along those lines of who is actually going to make money off of a either of these folks being being held because there's no bond, and it's now a much higher threat assessment to be released, or b being released but with some kind of monitoring and who's paying for those monitoring services. Um, the there's a monitoring service quote unquote, for um, um, immigrants, undocumented immigrants who are awaiting um, ICE um, trials and, and hearings. And the cost of those services are just exorbitant. I mean, it, it's this industry, I've actually seen it, it started, it, the, the main provider um, started actually here locally to where I live and just see 
within 18 months of how they scaled up and the just huge millions of dollars that have been made by people who the only way they can get out is to have this ankle bracelet that they're paying hundreds of dollars for the, the luxury of being out and being able to earn an income in order to pay for that service. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it's, it's just what you're saying. It's on either side. It's like, who's making the money when folks are in and who's making the money to be able to have, to be out. And what a place of privilege to be able to afford that ankle monitor, right? You know, that's not something everybody's going to be able to afford. And once again, there's a target to families who need their family member home and are going to pull that money together and try to get them home. I think that the point you just made and, and Meg mentioned early the, earlier, the movie 13th really digs into the corporate part of the prisons and what motivated that and how that came out of the Southern strategy and how that came out of um, just a way to control, control people and um, make money from the prison from the prisons. Um, back in the day, you would see people in stripes on the side of the road, right? Working. Well, not back in the day in Alabama, they're still out there picking up trash and working in striped jumpsuits. And you see them every day. I lived on an Air Force base in, in downtown Montgomery for a while and there was a federal prison there. And it looked like a beautiful park because the prisoners mowed and took care of it all the time. And it was these, it was beautiful grounds and I felt, kind of happy for them because they were out mowing and like they were outside and doing something because a lot of folks don't even go outside i visit a young man here on death row in alabama and he told me that the last time he'd been outside is about a year and a half and he's supposed to be outside an hour every day so he has not been outside and when he does go outside he's in a cage because he's on death row so, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I go visit him once a month um, and just treat him like a kid. Like I buy all kinds of stuff out of the vending machine and just feed him and feed him and feed him until he doesn't want any more food. But I bought him a pickle. I know that sounds really like silly, but I bought him a pickle about three visits ago. And to have a vegetable, and I know it's not a vegetable to you or I, but to like have a vegetable and to have that like treat, I've never had that much gratitude from anyone in my entire life. I've never ex experienced such extreme gratitude as I did for a pickle. So visiting folks who are incarcerated is an option that we have. And there are, you use, I mean, the CLF can connect people with you use living in their state. And just hearing that there is a denomination that believes that they're worthy of love where they are and they don't need fixed or redeemed or to accept any specific belief system in their life is really radical love. And, and the fact that they share it with each other and tell each other about the CLF and what we do is just beautiful because this growth has nothing to do with outreach. It has to do with capacity and our best evangelists, which are the folks who are living in prison. So that was one of the questions I had is what can what can somebody expect if they um, so I have some folks that sometimes are interested in the pen pal program, but they're not exactly sure like what that's going to be. And they got, you know, some of the people are afraid like, oh, is this person going to ask me for money or, you know, place to stay? day when when they're released or you know are they somehow going to be you know scamming me and it, it goes to all of those like preconceived notion number one of who is in um incarcerated of mm -hmm. course but maybe just a little bit about what they can expect from from the the clf and health program yeah um so there's two options really and one option is to have a pen pal who lives 10 states away from you that will never cross your path and and you can have all your mail forwarded through the CLF. So we use the CLF as your return address so they never know your last name or have your return address. 
The other option is to get a pen pal if you're thinking you might be interested in doing prison visits, getting a pen pal in your area or at least drivable distance and test the relationship out without them knowing you live close to them and find out whether it's going to work because pen pal relationships are like every relationship, right? We don't know whether we're going to get along. We don't know whether someone's pushy or going to push our buttons. It's a conversation and, you know, conversations can go a lot of different ways. So that's basically what the pen pal program does. And yes, people get asked for money, but the CLF is there for you when you're stressed about how you're going to respond and have boundaries. They're not supposed to ask for money. That doesn't mean they don't. Um, and the nice thing is, you know, I write a lot of people and I visit prisons so I can talk folks through that process. And if they feel like they don't know what to write about, I tell them like, write about your everyday, like I walked in the park yesterday. It doesn't have to be like specific about your family. My favorite pen pal match, they play Scrabble. I don't know how they do it, but they have been exchanging Scrabble boards for years. Like they write it in a letter and they send it back and forth. And the person on the free world won. I remember when she won because she was so excited because her pen pal had won every time. And so she finally won this year long Scrabble game. And she said, I have it hanging on my refrigerator. I'm so proud of beating them at Scrabble. So it can be, you know, Use your imagination and and it can be a place where you can make such a difference in somebody's day just to hear their name called at mail call is just radical love just to think that you might be addressing someone's letter who is trans by the name that they have they go by and using proper pronouns where all they're ever called in prison is a number. So it's really a good opportunity to get to know someone. And they, the other thing is, you know, we have guidelines and we have rules in place to help you. And we have support groups for people who are pen pals. We have circles of support. So if someone wants to join a small group ministry, who's a pen pal and be in community with other pen pals, there's that option this fall as well. I will say that the letters from the incarcerated members of CLF are without a doubt the most moving correspondence I ever have. Um, they're people who are really clear that this faith saves their lives. Letters from people who quit a gang because of something, so many letters from people who said, who were just told they were damned from the beginning. And, and it really Mass incarceration really does feel like an iteration of Calvinism to me that some people are just born to go to hell, you know, and um, that universalism demands <clears throat> that we say, no, that's not the nature of reality. Um, but that, you know, so many of them have just never been told in any way that they're all right. And, um, and they say things like one guy, he said, you know, this place wants me to become a beast and Unitarian Universalism won't let me do that. You know, I keep my humanity. Because like what Aisha said, they're not being treated with humanity. And so for them to have it reflected even through Quest or the UU World or a letter from the pen pal, they are so willing. I, you know, it's so humbling to try to write my columns for Quest in a way that would have anything to offer people living with so much less privilege than me. And what I see is they're not there to judge and critique. They are there to find any crumb that will help them make it through the day. And they are so grateful for the crumb, for anything that helps them. And really, you know, whenever they're asked what themes they want Quest to be about, they talk about hope and gratitude. And, you know, they're really looking for survival is what they're looking for. And, um, I, I'm just so moved. And as Mandy said, they're, they're our best evangelists by far. I mean, you know, that book testimony that I did, I think nine out of 54 of the people are prisoners. And, and one of them wrote to me and said, you know, you should do another book, um, This I Believe. So I wrote to Marshall Hawkins and I was like, you know, that's a really good idea. Because <laughs> the guy had written me his kind of statement of belief with the letter and it was really great. And I thought that would be an interesting book, you know, and, um, and I know I hear from people all the time who are so astonished to hear what they say and what they write. I mean, 
really smart, thoughtful people looking for a place to express what they know that will be heard and reflected back. So I really do recommend, I'm not a pen pal, but I'm just privileged to get letters from them and, and to respond, though not, not in such a way as to encourage a lot more letters from me, because I just can't. But I never fail to be awed by the thoughts. And like, I'll say one more thing. Amanda Aikman was teaching a class called Full Spectrum Joy, and it aligned each color of the rainbow with a trait that brings more joy into your life. And the color green, you were supposed to align yourself with something that's alive. And this guy wrote, in response to the assignment, he said, well, I'm in solitary, so I, and I've been here for a long time, so I'm the only person that's a thing that's alive. But then I noticed there were ants in the corner. So I just went and observed the ants all day and aligned myself with their life, and it brought me so much joy. And I just thought, my God, you know, like someone steals my watermelon out of my garden and it ruins my day. I mean, you know, and here's a guy finding hope and joy from ants. And so it really puts our lives into perspective. And it also really puts the lie to the fact that Unitarian Universalism is only for people of privilege because we hear over and over and over so profoundly how much they love this faith. And so anybody who says to me, oh, spiritual practice, that's for privileged people. I'm like, let me introduce you to 900 people I know. So anyway, that's a long ramble, but, but it's pretty awesome. And the other part of what Meg is saying is that they minister to us so much. I mean, the pen pal relationships, I hear over and over again from the free world folks how they might have been having a really hard time. And the person who really had time to listen deeply and respond to them was their pen pal who is incarcerated because they have the time to do that. One of the problems people run into is getting these voluminous and Meg's experiences, just pages and pages of letters. You know, you don't have to write pages and pages of letters back. You just need to write a response so that they know that you read it and you're thinking about them. And, you know, nine times out of 10, I'll send them a little card that says, hang in there. And then I'll write them a note. I don't, it's not that huge of a commitment and it's only for six months. So if it doesn't work out after six months and you wanna keep trying, we can find you a new pen pal. Um, you know, not all matches work. We know that from real life. And the other great thing about ending a pen pal relationship that I just wanna say, which sounds strange, is um, modeling how to end a relationship properly, which a lot of folks don't get an opportunity. They get moved and jerked around and you know they don't even know where they're gonna sleep the next day and they lose their connections to the people in the, in the institutions where they lived. And so if we can model consistency and we can model how to end a relationship, it's really important. Um, I just love the pen pal program. I just think that it's really the, the hidden gem of the CLF and all the stuff we do. It really- Is there a wait list of prisoners um, looking for pen pals, Mandy? There is, and there's a catch. So thank you, Meg, so much for bringing this up. Um, we have a lot of folks who have been charged with sex offenses. Now, first of all, before anybody freaks out about hurting kids, you can get charged as a sex offender for all kinds of things, including, you know, being in a prostitution situation and being like publicly gay. I mean, all kinds of things. I can't even tell you how many sex offender things there are out there. And the con the consequences for that is you get cut off from society, right? And in the prison, it's not safe for you. And so when people write, we ask them who they're comfortable writing. And 99% of the time, people are not comfortable writing someone with a sex offense. And I'd really like people to look into their heart and reconsider that because these are human beings who need connection and the really important thing is connections if we can do anything to combat recidivism it's to build connections and relationships with people who are incarcerated because that's the number one thing that helps is family connections well maybe we can't do that but at least we can give them a church family to be connected to when they come out 
My 17-year-old uh, this summer read In the Belly of the Beast uh, by Jack Henry Abbott. And if you're not familiar with that book, I highly recommend. It is it is deeply disturbing. And it is about, he was actually writing to Norman Mailer um, about his experience in prison. Um, and it is quite startling and, and really, really, it, I mean, it's in, in addition to 13th, because I think what folks, um, this has been going on for a long time and just the depravity of how his humanity was was being um, targeted all the time, but how he maintained a connection through these letters that turned into a book. And so um, I am going to email you, Mandy, to become a pen pal because I am, um, you know, I will admit I have not yet. So um, I will. So I will send you an email. And, Me and too. I would. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank well, that's you. good role modeling. I hope that our listeners and viewers are. And maybe, maybe next time I come on, we'll talk about what it's like to be a pen pal for you all. So that would be fun, huh? And if you're telling yourself yep. you're too busy, consider the two people who just stepped forward. <laughs> These are not people who want to be pen pals because they have nothing else going on in their lives. Right there, yes. <laughs> Well, I think it's what you said, Mandy, about, you know, it doesn't have to be a six page letter back. It can be a, hey, I'm thinking about you and I, you know, I receive what you what you sent out and and I can definitely do that. You know, I can definitely do that. It's it's slow motion pastoral care. Right. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> One letter at a time. And, and and there's a beauty to that, to writing a letter, right? There's there's some some romance and some some loveliness to to that process and and it gives the pen pals opportunities to think to think through what they want to share so and and romance isn't really the frame we'd want <laughs> no oh my gosh please don't ever sign i signed it love meg that was a really wrong thing to do you learn <laughs> yeah the boundaries are good boundaries are good yeah Love and never send a picture of yourself alone. No, no. That means you're in a relationship. And no. so we so we help with that if things get a little funny. So we're always around to answer questions and, and help folks with that. But hey, it's uh well I think I think part of it is just getting, you know, if we're going to really make a shift in the prison industrial complex, I think we really do need to shift how people are experiencing it. And, and right now folks are experiencing it, folks on the outside are experiencing it in a very particular way that makes it easy for it to continue and for it to continue to be a very profitable and lucrative business. And until folks are you know, challenging themselves to experience it in a different way. I think it's going to be really hard to um, to change that. You know, we we um, we have a local prison or jail board that is right now has a policy of informing ICE um, when they are releasing um, anybody that that they believe um, may have a detainer um, alert and. Um, you know, we're working on saying, hey, that's not okay. Um, and that, just that is getting people to say, oh, well, what else is going on at the regional jail? You know, if, if they're doing this, then it's very likely that, that there's some other things that are going on that probably aren't, uh, you know, uh, 100% about people's liberation. So, um, you know, taking taking a wider look. So it's, it's a good place to start. Yeah, and I'd like to have a whole show about abolition because I think that's such a complicated and interesting concept. So we'll, that's one we'll look forward to. Speaking of which, we've used our hour. It's been wonderful to be back together. Asia will be thinking of you next week out, out in the government, the world of government. <laughs> and the rest of us will be back. Thanks so much, Mandy, for your ministry and all that you do and see you next time.